Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry. My name is Chuck White and today we're going to talk about gases. We're going to tar talk first about the ideal gas law. We'll talk a little bit about the kinetic theory of gases. We'll talk a little bit about transport properties and effusion of gases. And then we'll finish up by talking about properties of real gases. First of all, we all know qualitatively that a solid is something that will hold its shape at fixed volume. A liquid is something that will um, uh, obtain the shape of the container free surface but has a fixed volume so it doesn't fill the container and a gas does both things it adopts the whole shape of the container and fills the whole volume of the container because the molecules are really spread out from one another as opposed to a liquid and solid where they're packed closely now most of the time gas molecules just fly through empty space and only occasionally collide with other molecules or with the wall of the container and that allows us to consider the pressure of a gas as the force on a, that exerted by a gas uh, per unit area of the wall. Now force is measured in uh, newtons, in SI units, and that's a change in momentum per unit time according to Newton's equations. And so the pressure depends on mainly on two things. First of all, the density of the molecules, so that uh, is linearly proportional to the number of molecules that hit the wall per unit time. And then the speed at which the molecules hit the wall because that's related to the momentum change. And so pressure depends linearly on both the gas density and the temperature of the molecules because that's related to the speed. Now, the ideal gas law comes from uh, exactly this idea where the constant of proportionality is something that we call R, the universal gas constant, which has units of 8.314 joules per mole per kelvin. Now I recommend always using SI units. Sometimes you'll see the ideal gas law written in terms of liters and atmospheres, um, and there it has units of a uh, value of 0.08205. But um, to be safe, what I recommend is converting all pressures to pascals, all volumes to cubic meters, moles are obviously just moles, and temperature in units of kelvins. And that way, if you use the gas constant as 8.314 joules per mole per kelvin, you'll always be guaranteed to come out with the right units, no matter what problem you're solving. So now Boyle's law is an earlier gas law that related volume and pressure. And uh, what that said is that P times V is a constant, and that really comes out of the ideal gas law, um, where the number of moles and the temperature is, cold, is held constant. Charles's law uh, related volume and temperature, uh, and again, that's consistent with the ideal gas law, where V over T would be a constant at constant N and P. Similarly, Avogadro's law, which related the volume of gas to the number of moles of gas, says that V over N is a constant at constant P and T. And again, that comes out as being consistent with the ideal gas law. Those other laws came first, and the ideal gas law sort of rolls them all into one version. Now let's... Um, consider some examples. First of all, we can calculate the density of oxygen gas at 3.5 bars and 400 kelvins by converting bars into pascals and then uh, plugging pascals um, R and T in kelvins into the ideal gas law. We get N over V is 105.2 moles per cubic meter and we can con convert to other units, uh, say grams per liter, by multiplying by uh, 32 grams per mole, which is the molar mass of oxygen, and dividing by 100 liters uh, per cubic meter. So we get 3.368 grams per liter as the density of oxygen gas. We can calculate the mass of nitrogen in a uh, automobile tire, for example, um, by converting to SI units. Suppose the pressure that you measure with a gauge is 32 pounds per square inch. Well, it turns out that absolute pressure, you'd have to add um, the pressure of one atmosphere to that. So that would be 46.7 PSI absolute pounds per square inch absolute, or uh, 3.22 times 10 to the fifth pascals. 
12 liters is 0.012 cubic meters, and so the number of moles of nitrogen gas in the tire would be 1.55 moles, and we could use the mol molar mass of nitrogen to convert that to uh, grams. So for example, in, th in this problem, we'd have 43.41 grams of nitrogen gas inside this 12 liter tire at 300 kelvins and 32 psi. Now we can also do a more comp complicated calculation involving a balloon. If you heat the, ins the air inside a hot air balloon to an average of 100 kelvins hotter than the outside air, which would be 300 kelvins in this example, and the balloon has to lift 650 kilograms, including the mass of the balloon itself, then what you're really doing is you're taking um, that gas and you're expelling uh, one-third of the gas by heating it up. Uh, so to calculate the volume of the balloon, we'd actually take four times the volume of the balloon. Um, and so in order to uh, calculate the buoyancy, we would have to take four times the volume of um, 650 kilograms of air at 300 and 300 kelvins and one atmosphere. So we use the uh, we can calculate the number of moles of uh, gas as 650,000 grams divided by an average molar mass for air of 28.97 grams per mole. That's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen primarily, and that would be 2.244 times 10 to the fourth moles of air. Uh, the volume of uh, that uh, number of moles we can calculate using the ideal gas equation, ideal gas law, and uh, that would be 552.3 cubic meters. And so the balloon actually has to have four times this volume in order to generate this buoyancy. And uh, so that would be 2,209 cubic meters. For a roughly spherical balloon, that's approximately uh, 34 meters in diameter. Now let's talk about the kinetic theory of gases. The kinetic theory assumes that molecules are negligibly small. They don't actually take up uh, any significant volume in the container, the molecules themselves. The average kinetic energy of a mole of gas is 3 halves RT, and all collisions with other molecules and walls of the container are elastic. That is to say, they don't uh, take up any net energy. And so if the kinetic energy of a mole of gas is 3 halves RT, then on a molecular basis, that's Avogadro's number times a half mv squared. And we can solve this equation for v squared, and it turns out to be 3 RT over m, where m is the molar mass. And if we take the square root of both sides of this equation, then the root mean square velocity, uh, one measure of average velocity, is the square root of 3 RT over m. So for nitrogen gas at 300 kelvins, we can use this equation to calculate that the root mean square velocity of nitrogen gas under these conditions is 516.8 meters per second. That's ripping along pretty fast. So let's talk about effusion, which is a transport property of gases. When molecules undergo effusion through a hole that's really small compared with the mean free path between collisions, then the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. That's a result that comes directly out of the kinetic theory. So R, the rate of effusion, is proportional to 1 over the square root of m. And so for two different gases, we can write that R1 square root of M1 is equal to R2 square root of M2. And so R1 over M2 is the ratio of the square root of M2 over M1. So how would we use this? It turns out that uh, most of the uranium used in nuclear reactors and in atomic weapons in the United States has been enriched in fissionable um, U-235 by a multi-stage gas phase effusion of uranium hexafluoride. This takes place at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So at each stage in this effusion, the relative rates of effusion are the square root of 352 divided by 349, which are the molar masses of these two isotopes, is 1.00429. So 0.429% enrichment at each stage. So many, many successive stages of effusion were required to obtain the desired level of enrichment in this lighter uh, isotope. And so at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, they did this using many, many containers. Now let's talk about real gases. Uh, we've seen the ideal gas law, and we've also seen that um, this ideal gas law um, 
ignored the, the actual volume of the molecules themselves, and it also ignored intermolecular forces. So it said that all of these uh, collisions are entirely elastic. Um, there's a hard sphere equation of state, which would account for the finite volume of um, gases, and so B would be equal to the um, molar volume of uh, gases, but also ignores intermolecular forces. And so that would be P times V minus NB, that would be the free volume, all the volume that's not occupied by molecules, is equal to NRT. There's another equation of state which is very useful called the van der Waals equation of state, and that has this parameter B, which would account for the finite volume effects, but also a uh, of parameter A, which accounts for finite intermolecular forces. And so we can um, we have listed here the van der Waals uh, parameters A and B that go into this equation of state for three different gases, helium, uh, CO2, and carbon tetrachloride. And you can see that helium has very small parameters, so it's nearly ideal. Carbon tetrachloride has much larger parameters, and so it's much less ideal. But um, basically, it's pretty good. Next time, we'll talk about quantum mechanics. We'll talk about wave-particle duality and several other things. We'll see you then.